going to go ahead and get started into this morning's message. We are going to conclude our series in the first part of Daniel today uh, entitled Confronting the Challenges of the New Normal. Uh, we've been looking at Daniel and his friends and their challenges in a new situation that's kind of analogous to our own. So those of you who haven't been around, just kind of recapping here. The Babylonian Empire, the biggest empire of its day in around 605 BC, had attacked Jerusalem and carried away a first wave of exiles to live in Babylon. Uh, these people were likely separated from their families. They were placed in a foreign and at times hostile culture. Uh, their lives were characterized by uncertainty in the midst of forces that were greater than, than themselves, forces that, that they couldn't control. Culturally and socially, they were the back foot. Uh, you know, they, they were the new people that didn't have the levers of power. And in the midst of that situation, they neither rebelled nor assimilated, but tried to walk a third way. Uh, they, they, they took on Babylonian names. They, they were educated at the top Babylonian universities. And they worked in the Babylonian government. And that created all kinds of tricky situations to negotiate. Uh, how do you maintain your identity? As a person of God, how do you stay faithful to God and yet be fully engaged in the world, which was not just their idea, it was a command of God through the prophet Jeremiah. So part of their faithfulness was that they would work for the welfare of Babylon, not just keep to themselves and to maintain some sort of religious or ethnic purity. So that's their situation. We've been looking at that situation as kind of similar to our own, as you know, those of us who identify as people of God, uh, that, we, that we live in a culture where such people are no longer the, the cultural and social front foot. <laughs> we're, we're kind of back a step in terms of influence and, and prestige. And we're in some ways at the mercy of forces that seem greater than we are, whether they're cultural forces or you know, all of the uncertainty of the pandemic. There are all these things happening around us and we don't control them. And what does it look like to, to remain faithful and yet engaged in such a situation? So that's what we've been looking at by looking at the stories of Daniel and his friends. And today we're going to conclude with the famous story, or at least famous for some of us, of Daniel in the lion's den from Daniel chapter 6. So I'm going to pray and then we'll unpack the story and consider what God might be saying to us in the midst of that. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you uh, for this chance to open your word. We know, Lord, that these are not just words on a page. They have stood the test of time. And generation after generation of your people has borne witness that you have spoken in this word. And so we pray that you would do it again today. Open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to you, Lord, and help us to hear a word from you that will sustain us, a word that will help us to live faithfully in our generation to accomplish the purposes for which you've sent us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, we'll go ahead, we'll, we'll tell the story, just kind of have some fun with it, live into it a little bit, then consider how God might be speaking to us through it. All right, so 
as the story begins, Darius the Mede has become the new king. So in chapter 5, which we skipped over, uh, there had been a king, uh, Belshazzar, who was kind of the last king of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, in the story, he is kind of mocking God, and that does not turn out well for him. He ends up dying that night, but not before he's terrified by a sign that lets him know that judgment is upon him. Uh, that night, he is, he is assassinated, and Darius the Mede becomes king. So he's the new king, and he's the king of a new empire. Uh, a lot of people, there's been some confusion about who Darius the Mede actually is. Uh, most scholars believe that Darius is a title, kind of like Pharisee or Caesar. Uh, it says in, in Daniel 5.31 that he received the kingdom, like he was appointed by someone higher. <laughs> so uh, he's probably not the head of the entire empire, but he is the king of Babylon. Uh, he has at times been identified with a guy named Gubaru, who is one of Cyrus's generals. But anyway, Darius, we just call him that, uh, has become the new king, succeeding Belshazzar. And he introduces a new governing structure. So here at the beginning of chapter 6, he appoints 120 satraps. These are provincial governors. And then over them, he appoints three commissioners to oversee them. And one of the three is Daniel, uh, who by this time is elderly and has been long established in the political world of Babylon. Daniel, even uh, as he did when he was a young man, continues to stand out. I mean, he is just excellent. And he gets noticed again, not just for his personal excellence, but because of a sense of something spiritual about him. So Daniel 6.3, uh, says that he was noticed because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. So you can make of that what you will. You know, is it the Holy Spirit? You know, I, is it just that he's got a way about him? I don't know. But they're, they're noticing something, and it seems like a spiritual thing that they see in him. And Darius quickly decides to promote him to oversee the entire kingdom. And Darius isn't the only one who's noticed Daniel. Uh, other political leaders, people who would have to work for Daniel, are scheming behind the scenes to try to find a way to impede him or to take his place. Uh, Daniel has so much integrity that they can't find a credible accusation to make against him. Like they can't say that he's corrupt. They can't say that he's, t he's on the take or something because he's not. And they can't point at anything. And they conclude that the only way to take him down would be to go after something related to his faith in God. So everyone's strength is their weakness, right? So if Daniel's strength is his faith in God and his identity as a person of God, maybe they can find a way to use that against him. But yeah, but that's their conclusion. Verse 5, they say, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him regarding the law of his God. So I, I do think that's quite a testimony, isn't it? Uh, to be the kind of person who people know that there, there really is nothing legitimate that they could ever say against you that if they're going to take you down, the only way to do it would be with your faith. Anyway, they, they, they hatch this plan to have the king institute a temporary law. So for 30 days, no one can offer a prayer to any god or person except the king on penalty of death. They'll be thrown into the lion's den, which is not just death, I guess, but it's also kind of a grisly death. 
maybe that's an appeal to Darius's vanity. Or maybe Darius saw this as a politically expedient move, you know, a way to emphasize that he is now the supreme ruler while assuring his subjects that he doesn't intend to outlaw their religions uh, just to establish his own authority. It's a 30-day window, right? Anyhow, they get him to sign the law in a way that it cannot be revoked. It said, according to the law of the Medes and Persians. So they have a, they have a procedure under which if you, if you sign the law in this way, it cannot be undone. <clears throat> which I guess must have seemed like a good idea to Darius at the time. That's going to put Daniel in a bind. And that is exactly what his rivals are hoping for, to get Daniel to expose his ultimate allegiance so that they can accuse him and get rid of him. Now, Daniel was not born yesterday. Like I said, he's, he's aged at this point, and he has decades of experience in the Babylonian government. He's both wise and experienced. He, he knows he's being watched. So how does he respond? Well, let's take a look in verse 10. It says that now when Daniel learned that the document was signed, he entered his house and in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem and he opened, I'm sorry, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day praying and offering praise before his God just as he had been doing previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel offering a prayer and imploring favor before his God. And then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any person who offers a prayer to any God or person besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be thrown into the lion's den? The king replied, the statement is true. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they responded and spoke to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. Uh, o king, or to the injunction which you've signed, but keeps offering his prayers three times a day. So we'll stop there just for a minute. I, I have to admit, had I been Daniel, I would have been tempted to lay low. After all, the, the injunction is temporary. It's 30 days. And I could go without public praying for 30 days. And one doesn't have to make a, a show of one's faith. Right? But Daniel who apparently had a public habit of kneeling in prayer three times a day so that everybody could see him, holds to his usual practice, which is exactly what they're hoping for. And so, of course, they know where to find him because he opens the windows when he prays, right? They, everybody has seen him doing this. So they know when he's going to do this and they know what he's doing. And so they show up and there he is praying. And so they go to the king to rat him out. King Darius, they say, didn't you sign this irrevocable law saying that whoever prays to anybody except you would be thrown into the lion's den? And he says, well, sure. Uh, you were there when I signed it. And they say, well, we are shocked. Shocked, I tell you to discover that Daniel has been praying to his God. Uh, only, only too eager, right, <laughs> to, to go ahead and tell. So verse 14, it says that then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on rescuing Daniel. So he, he kind of knows that something is up, but now he's caught, right? And until sunset, he kept exerting himself to save him. 
Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, oh, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute with the king established can be, uh, may be changed. Uh, then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and thrown into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, uh, your God whom you continually serve will himself rescue you. Or some versions say, may your God whom you continually serve rescue you. And a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing could be changed regarding Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no entertainment was brought before him and sleep fled from him. Then the king got up at dawn at the break of day and went in a hurry to the lion's den. And when he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out in a troubled voice. The king began speaking and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? So the king was not thrilled by this turn of events. He's deeply distressed and, and tries really hard to find a way to save Daniel, but it's no use, right? The, 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 the law is ironclad and it can't be revoked as Daniel's rivals are kind of giddy to remind him. And so the king gives the order to throw Daniel into the lion's den and goes back to the palace and doesn't sleep. Uh, stays away from the dancing girls, uh, turns off the Netflix, and instead he fasts. I, I don't know if he's praying, I don't know if he's mourning, but, you know, whatever he's doing, he's not doing his usual routine. He's really upset about this, and it seems like he's hopeful that somehow Daniel might be saved. And those of you who know the story know what happened next. Uh, verse 21, Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. And they've not harmed me since I was found innocent before him and also toward you, O king. I have committed no crime. Then the king was very glad and gave orders for Daniel to be lifted out of the den. So Daniel was lifted out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and threw them, their children, and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the, bottom of the den before the lions overpowered and crushed all their bones. Uh, kind of a, like I said, a grisly sort of ending. Uh, the good news, of course, is that Daniel is improbably delivered. Uh, he sees this as a sign of his innocence, though we saw in Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace that it's far from clear that such an outcome is always guaranteed. Uh, never forget that Jesus was innocent and he still got killed. But this is how Daniel views his deliverance and it is certainly a powerful miraculous rescue. Uh, end of the chapter, verse 25. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages who were living in all the land, may your peace be great. I issue a decree that in all the realm of my kingdom, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living, and I'm sorry, for he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. He rescues, saves, performs signs and miracles in heaven and on earth. 
he who has also rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus. So the end. You know, yay, Daniel. Uh, that's a happy ending. But what does God say to us through this? Uh, not just in this section of the story, but in Daniel's story as a whole. Uh, this story, this story of Daniel uh, and the lion's den is often told to children uh, as a lesson on honesty and integrity. You know, certainly Daniel has tremendous integrity. Uh, somewhere along the way, I, I think many of us have simplified the story almost to an equation that if we work hard and we're honest and we have integrity, that God will give us success. I mean, isn't Daniel constantly being promoted? Doesn't God always come through for him? And then we imagine something like that for ourselves. That if we will be honest, that if we will have integrity, that if we will be faithful to God, that we'll be successful. Until it doesn't work. Until we're full of honesty and integrity and we lose our job anyway or we don't even get hired. We lose the possibility because the person realizes that we identify with Jesus. Uh, we're doing our best to be faithful to God and we don't prosper. It seems like we suffer. Uh, we count on God's deliverance and it doesn't come in the form that we were expecting. And we feel burned. I think it's important for us to keep the range of Bible outcomes in mind. So the Daniel story is a fun story because he keeps winning. He's miraculously delivered and, and his friends are miraculously delivered in chapter 3. But as we said earlier, Jesus suffers and dies. He prays, if it's possible, let this cup pass from my lips. And apparently, it isn't possible. Uh, yes, he does get the victory. He is later raised from the dead. But not until he's been publicly humiliated and physically harmed and endured a whole bunch of suffering. Uh, the Apostle Paul is both wildly successful and constantly being beaten and thrown in jail and stoned. He finds resistance and opposition everywhere he goes. Uh, even in Daniel's story, I think something that gets covered up here is that Daniel's integrity gets him into the lion's den. Like, if he hadn't had all that integrity, he wouldn't have had to worry about the lion's den. It's the fact that he refuses to back down, that, that he, he recognizes that for him, as a, as a person living in the world, in this Babylonian world, but not being of that world, that sooner or later there would be a line that he could not cross. And this is that line. He refuses to treat the king as if he were God. And if that's the requirement, then he just says, well, then I guess I'll face the lions. So the lesson here is not that if we have integrity, God will give us success, uh, the, the kind of success that we crave, but rather that in this complicated life as an exile, uh, in a world where we are like foreigners, 
who have a different identity and a different loyalty, a different set of values, that sooner or later, we will have to take a stand, even if it costs us. God may miraculously deliver us in the moment, or victory may not come except in the longer game. But we better be ready for the moment because it's coming. There will always be a time when you have to declare your ultimate allegiance and you're going to have to decide who that is. Uh, know this, when you come to that moment, what you're going to be facing will be neither pleasant nor attractive. Uh, you will feel like God is all you have, and you will be right. And so I think the challenge for those of us who live as exiles here in Vancouver and beyond is who is our ultimate loyalty to, and are we ready to take our stand? Will we take our stand when the time comes? Pulling back the camera a bit and looking at the bigger picture of Daniel's life, I think it's important for us to embrace that in our calling as, ex as exiles, or what the Apostle Peter calls foreigners and strangers in 1 Peter 2.11, the goal is to not overpower the world, to, to show them by getting more votes or forcing them somehow to do what's right. Uh, it is to live among a people who do not know God and to show them what God is like, to embody his heart in our compassion, in our hospitality, in our generosity, uh, in yielding ourselves in servanthood and in a desire to bless and not curse, uh, to be willing to endure rejection, humiliation, and suffering for the sake of love, like Jesus did, and to seek the welfare of the city and its people among whom we live, even when they don't seek ours. Let's pray. Uh, Holy Spirit, come. Uh, speak a word to your people, and to those who would be your people, who want to identify with you. Uh, come and help us to know what it means for us to live uh, as exiles in this land. Lord Jesus, you are the king, and that is not immediately obvious to many people in the world. Uh, but we recognize your kingdom and we pray uh, that it would come among us. Uh, help us, Lord, to have courage, uh, to be ready to take our stand when the time comes, uh, to trust in your deliverance, whether in the near term or in the long term. Uh, thank you that you are faithful uh, in ways that we don't comprehend. And uh, for those, Lord, who are still figuring out where they're at with you, I pray that you would bring a clarity, that you would reveal yourself uh, as the one who invites them to come close, uh, as the one who gave himself for them so that they might live. So uh, encourage their hearts, Lord, draw them close to yourself. Uh, make them ready for the day when they can say, an unequivocal yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen.